Good morning. We are on the last page of the book. Okay, Revelation 22, and we are going to be in verses 1 through 5 this morning. In my Bible, it's the last page. Okay, is it in your Bible? Is it the last page in your Bible? So what are we going to do after this? Are we just going to stop because we're at the end of the book? I mean, no, that would, you know, some people would do that, but we're, we ain't scared, right? I'm starting a new series in two weeks. Um, it is going to be called Bad Lip Reading. Did God really say that? Okay, Bad Lip Reading. Did God really say that? There's some things going around that people say, oh, well, God won't give you more than you can handle. Okay, is that, did God really say that? Or, or, or God just wants you to be happy. Okay, did, did God really say that? Okay, so we're going to be exploring some of those accepted fallacies that we tell each other or that people here in churches. And uh, anyway, we, we're, we'll do an introduction to it next week, and you'll see why I call it bad lip reading. Okay, because there's nothing worse than bad lip reading. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's very difficult. So let's begin. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Last week we talked about the heavenly city, the amazing design of it, the glamour of the city, and that the main attraction is God himself. Today we get into uh, the blessings of eternity. We see John transitions from the big picture, and he's getting smaller and, and more detailed in his picture here in, in chapter 22. He goes from the picture of the kingdom, the heavenly city coming down, and then we see now that he is going to give us a picture of the intimate blessings that God has for us. There was an aged missionary couple that was returning to the United States for the first time in many, many years. They were retiring back in their home country. They had lived in Africa and seen many people come to faith in Christ. They had really just poured their lives out for the Lord. And they're on this plane and they pull up to the gate there and there was a celebrity on their airplane. And this celebrity, when, when he walks off of the plane, there's paparazzi, there's people, there's even a small band, and, and all these people are just going crazy over these celebrities. Last off the plane are these two godly missionaries poured their lives out for the Lord. And the husband looks at the wife, he says, boy, that was a welcome, wasn't it? I mean, we've served our life in in. in Africa with nothing, and we've served the Lord, and this celebrity who hadn't really done anything gets all this acclaim getting off the plane, and we get nothing. So they find their way to their hotel, and he's complaining the whole way, and they get their stuff put away, and his wife says, you know, honey, I'm going to go do something. Uh, I've got to run an errand real quick, but I think you need to talk to the Lord about your bad attitude. He just kind of grimaced at her. So she leaves, comes back. First thing she says when she walks in the door, Honey, did you talk to the Lord about your bad attitude? He said, I did. She said, Well, what did he say? She said, Well, he said, It was as if the Lord whispered in my ear, and he says, My child, don't worry, because you're not home yet. You see, too many of us live in this world as if this is our home. This is a second of a dress rehearsal before we get to eternity. But we live as if this is everything. We make things on this earth that won't go with us. We put our faith in things that won't deliver us, that won't change us. We live in such a way apart from the Lord that, that we make this our home. But this is not our home. If you've put your faith in Christ and you believe in Him and you walk with Him and you know that your sins have been forgiven, your home is not here. It is in heaven with God Himself. 
I think we need to get a better vision of our lives, a life that matters not so much here, but the things that we do here that last forever and ever and ever. One of my favorite movies, Maximus Dex Decimus, he is the gladiator. He is beginning the movie, they are about to go against the Gauls. And he's riding his horse up and down the legion of men. And he looks at them and he says, remember, the way that you live your life here echoes for eternity. I think we need to remember that today. The way that we live our lives here echoes for eternity. Keep that in mind as we read today. Beginning verse 1 of chapter 22, the book of Revelation. John speaking here. Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city. The tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing or for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the, in the city, and His slaves will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. These blessings that we're going to see, He... he meets us here, and he shares them with us. The first blessing that we're going to see for eternity is perfect provision. Perfect provision. We see that he begins with that which none of us can live without, and that is water. You see, water is one of those creations that God put on this earth for our benefit, for our pleasure, but it is also for our life. You can't last very long without water, without any hydration of any kind. Here we see the river of living water, sparkling like crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city. Some people look at this and they say, well, that is, that is symbolic of, of eternal life and God's presence. And, and some people say that, oh, well, I believe it's a literal river. Well, I believe it's both. I believe we look at it and we see from the very throne of God, the one who has created everything, all things, from the beginning and all the way through, that the living water flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flows down through the middle of the city. We discussed the city last week, 1,500 miles square. Length, width, height, this huge city that comes down from the clouds. And the source of water, the living water, is God and Jesus Himself. You see, this water is not the first time that we've understood about this living water. Jesus, in John chapter 4, He's been traveling with the disciples. He sits down at the well. They're in Samaria. Samaritan woman comes to the well while... The disciples go in and get some food, and he's speaking to her, and he, he talks to her about maybe giving him some water. She said, why would you want water from me, a Samaritan woman? He says, ah, he said, you forget. He said, if you knew who was talking to you, then you would know that I could give you water that is living. This living water that is so deep, it is greater than anything that you can imagine. He says, everybody who drinks of this water from this hole in the ground will get thirsty again. But everybody who drinks of the living water will never thirst again. You see, this living water, Christ Himself, the Father, the Holy Spirit living with us, giving us everything that we need. That's not the last time. John chapter 7 it's at the end of the festival. Jesus stands up and he says, If any one of you are thirsty, come to me. 
come to me. Jesus didn't have a lemonade stand. He didn't have big gallons of good, fresh water behind him. Right? He wasn't raising money for the kingdom. He was telling them that your very need, the greatest need that you have of this water is found only in a person. That he is the vessel, the creator of that living water. And this living water is going to be available to us at all times in heaven. He said it is sparkling like crystal. It is pure. It is beautiful. It will quench any thirst that we ever have. It will satisfy every need we can ever have. It will take care of us. It will fulfill us. It will be that that, that gives us life every moment of every day in heaven. Isn't it great that God takes care of every little need that we have? I mean, we saw the immense structure, the beauty of everything, the intricacy of this building, but yet the very center of it is the very living water of God. Flows from God Himself in the middle of the broad street. It goes down in the middle of the city where everyone has access to it. God does not say only a few people can drink of this. No, he says it is for everyone. He goes on and he says, The tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is not the first time we see the tree of life either. We see Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. We see that the tree was in the garden. And then God said, you can eat of any tree except the one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. He said, but you can have of any other tree that you want. He said, the tree of life is one that you can eat of forever, and you will live forever. But then when they fell, when sin entered the world through their disobedience to a holy and perfect God, they were kicked out of the garden, never to have access to that tree of eternal life again. You see, God didn't destroy the tree. He didn't destroy the garden. He just kept it safe for us. This tree is massive. I, I picture this. Ezekiel says that there are trees lining on each side of the river here and at the beginning in chapter 2 that this one tree, this one tree of life, I picture it being so big that it straddles the river of God. And it says its, its fruit is unmatched. It, it bears 12 kinds of fruit eternally. It will never not have fruit. Now it says it will bear a new fruit every month. We won't have a month as we do now because now we understand the months that we have are based upon the lunar cycle. There's not going to be a moon. I think sometimes we think that there'll be no time in heaven. I think we'll still have time in heaven. I don't know how it will be measured, but you see all through the book of Revelation we've had uses of time in these things. I think we will have time there. And this tree will bear all kinds of fruit. Now, wouldn't that be something? I mean, how many just love fruit? I mean, I love good peaches. I love good apples. It, 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 just imagine this tree of life bears the best fruit every month. Never rot. It'll never have flies. You'll never have to spray it to keep the bugs away. You won't even have to wash it when you pick it up off the tree. You can just eat it. I picture the fruit being so scrumptious that it'll just ooze down your chin. It'll just cover you with goodness. And that'll be the way it is every piece of fruit that God gives you off of the tree. You see that this fruit is going to be the fruit that keeps us alive. It, it bears eternally, but it also keeps us eternal in God's eyes. It says that the leaves of the trees are for healing the nations. Now, this word healing here, is, there's not going to be any sickness, there's not going to be any death, there's not going to be any of that, okay? Uh, but the word here the, for for healing is the word therapeo in Greek, therapeutic. It will not keep us, it will not 
heal us from sickness. It will keep us well. It will keep us perfect in tune, our bodies perfectly in tune with God's creation. And it says the healing of the nations. I think that many people have the wrong idea too, that when we get there, everybody's going to look the same. I think that's a false idea of heaven. I think we will still have all of the nations represented that God created on this earth. You see, God's a God of beauty and variation, right? I don't think when we get there, everybody's going to have the same skin color, the same height, the same hair. I don't think that's going to happen. I think when we get there, we're all going to be as we were originally created. God will have people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. We will worship with our African brothers and sisters and our South American Latinos, and, and we will worship with the Inuit Indians from the North Pole, and we will worship together with the Lord in a great variation of His creation. It will be beautiful. The only difference is we will speak one language and we will be able to understand each other. This fruit will be beautiful. God is perfect provision for us. The leaves on the trees are the healing for the nations. What a great day that will be. All of us together, eating together this beautiful fruit in the presence of God. The next thing that we see at the end of that verse is that there will no longer be any curse. No more curse in heaven. We think we'll What's the curse? Well, when sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden, everything became cursed. Everything. We think sin is only affecting our hearts, but sin affects everything. Sin affects the world. Sin affects the, the, the very environment that we live. It affects our minds. It affects our bodies, right? This effect of sin, the curse of sin, it has been with us since the beginning. But in heaven, there will be no more curse. Let's just think about some of the curses that we have to put up with today. How about the curse of a decaying body? Has anybody got some aches and pains? Anybody has to see the doctor regularly? Anybody had any problems with your body lately? If you haven't, you're going to. It's just the way it works. Right? I mean, it's just, we break down. This body decays. That is the result of the curse. You see, Adam and Eve were not supposed to die. They were not supposed to grow older. The bodies that God had created them were to last and designed to last forever. And the bodies that God is going to give us will last forever. You see, we won't have to deal with that curse anymore. How about the curse of Suffering. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more family members that run away from God. There'll be no more crime. There'll be no more murder. There'll be no more evil in the world. There'll be no more division. There'll be no more disasters. Just think of the things in your life that you struggle with. There'll be no more personality defects that we all have. If you're a procrastinator, you won't procrastinate in heaven. If you're a type A personality, you ain't going to be in heaven. You see, God is allowed us and our bodies to see the effects of this sin around us. You see, when Christ was hung upon the cross, it says that the sins of man, past, present, and future, were put upon him to pay the price of the curse. Of the curse that has invaded the world. You see, but when he died on the cross, and the curse, the only curse that was broken at that moment was the eternality of sin in our lives. You see, the curse that was broken on the cross was the one that says we can now, through Christ, when we put our faith in Him, we now will have the strength not to sin. You see, that's the breaking of that curse. But every other curse exists. 
You look around and you think of the beautiful sunsets and the beautiful sunrises and the beautiful things around us. That, is the, that even in its beauty is affected by the sin and the curse of sin all around us. I can't even imagine the beauty of things that will be when we get together with God in heaven. The beauty of it will be extraordinary. Death will no longer exist. Do you realize three people around the world die every second? 180 people a minute around the world. It's about 11,000 people die every hour around the world. And about 250,000 people die every day on this earth. It's amazing, isn't it? The, just the vast numbers of people. But that won't happen anymore. When we get to heaven, there'll be no more funerals. There'll be no need to mourn what was because we will be with God forever. A mom and her son were walking along the beach one day they saw a seagull that had died. The little boy asked mom, says, well, what happened? Well, mom, wanting to kind of soften the blow of the harsh reality of death, said, well, you know, um, that little bird got real sick, and so God allowed it to die and go to heaven. So that little boy looked for a minute, didn't quite understand, and he looked at his mom, and he says, well, so why did God throw it back down here? You see, we won't have to worry about those things. Even the environment, the animals, everything will be perfect again. The beauty of it will be extraordinary. You go on. The next thing that we see, the blessing, is the presence of God. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. We've prayed earlier, right? You see, when we pray, we come into the presence of God. Right? And when we close our eyes or we bow our heads or we look up and we look to the skies or whatever posture we're in when we pray, we are coming before God and we can only imagine what God looks like. We can only imagine that scene of, of us actually being in the throne room offering our prayers to God. But you see here, we will have personal access to the very throne of God. No longer when we pray, when we talk to the Lord, will we have to imagine what God looks like or, or what He's doing when we're praying. No longer will that happen. We will get to go to the very throne of God and see God. We will see Jesus, the Lamb, their throne. And we will be in the presence of God. There'll be no distractions. You ever pray and you start to pray and then you start thinking about this. And then you think about a grocery list. And then you think about things that you've forgotten. And then you start just, it, you're distracted. But you see, when we come into the presence of God, there'll be no distraction possible. Because we will be in the presence of Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and all things. We won't have to search for words to pray. We won't stand there and think, oh man, I should have asked for this. Because we'll be in His presence. We won't have to sit there and, and critique our own prayer. Well, you know, I didn't say that right. I, I wonder if I need to. It won't be any of that. We will be in the presence of God. And it'll be extraordinary. What a blessing of being in the presence of God forever. It goes on and it says, And his slaves will serve him. We are going to have perfect worship as a blessing in eternity. The word here, it says, will serve him. That word serve in Greek is also translated as worship. The picture that we're getting here is the picture of the Old Testament. The, the, the priests and the ministers would come and they would do the business in the temple. They would light the fires and they would help with the sacrifices. And the, the, those would sing and then some would play instruments. And then the, the priest would minister to the Lord. And it was an act of service to the Lord, but it was an act of worshiping the Lord. You see, one thing that we often make the mistake of doing, we separate serving the Lord and worshiping the Lord. Okay, in, in the Bible and according to God's vocabulary, serving the Lord and worshiping the Lord are the same thing. 
You see, we miss that as Christians a lot. We'll make announcements from the pulpit. We'll put things in the bulletin. Hey, we've got opportunities to serve here. We've got opportunities to do this. And, and please, we need you to serve here. One thing we just need to scratch out and from now on is one, we need you to worship here. We need you to worship here. Because whatever you do, if, you, if you're blowing a horn or using your voice or, or all those that are working with the kids right now, we're going to pray for Awanas at the end of the service and all those that are going to be working with the kids on Wednesday night. Uh, the, the, the people who work with the youth on Monday and with Celebrate Recovery on Tuesday and with the other ministries that we have, that is not just service, that is worship to God. We miss that. Sometimes we get just in the grind of doing stuff and, and we're doing this and we're serving the Lord, but yet we forget that we are serving a holy king, and it is worship. God help us when we complain about serving the Lord. Because if you complain about serving the Lord, you're complaining about worshiping God. And that is a heart problem. That is a heart problem. Now, the other side of that is, if your worship becomes just for you, if you toot a horn or you sing or if you teach or if you work with the kids just so that you can be noticed by everyone around you, boy, they're working hard for God, then that is not worship. That is idolatry. There is the other side of that too. You see, the perfect balance is serving the Lord for the Lord, worshiping Him, coming before Him and serving Him. Not because we have to, but because we get to. You see, our service completely changes when we realize what Christ has done for us. We are the wretched sinners. And He gave us grace and mercy at the cross. Something that we didn't deserve, we can't pay back. And we need to look at every day as an opportunity to worship the Lord. You see, our greeters were greeting you this morning. They weren't greeting, they were worshiping. Our ushers that come down when we do the offerings or whatever we do, those ushers, they're not ushing. They're worshiping. You see, we've got to change our vocabulary in many ways. It says here that they will serve Him. I've heard many people say, well, heaven's going to be boring if all we're doing is just serving God. That's a bad attitude to have. You see, if you think about serving the Lord as something that is cumbersome, then you're not serving the Lord, and you may have never, ever understood what serving the Lord is. The closest I've ever come to God is serving Him, being with Him. It goes on, the next thing that's connected with serving Him is verse 4, they will see His face. We will have this intimate relationship with God that will be so close, you won't have to wonder if you're doing His will. You won't have to wonder if He's listening to your prayers. You won't have to wait for an answer to any prayer that you may have before the Lord. Because the intimate relationship will be so close. You see, everything changed. In the garden, God used to walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And then after their sin, God kicked them out of the garden, and we see that the relationship completely changed between God and man. You see Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, Moses is saying, God, I want to see you. God says, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. You see, we see the transition the, the curse of sin affected our intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. And now all of that is restored because we will see Him face to face. What an amazing day that will be. We won't have to do it through Skype. We won't have to log into the internet to see God. We won't have to hide our eyes from His awesomeness because in our Perfect bodies, we will be able to stand in the presence of God and know Him intimately. Whew. What a blessing that will be. 
part of this intimacy will also be his name will be on their foreheads. Now, of course, in my flesh, I'm thinking we're all running around with God's name on our heads. I don't know how that's going to work out. In my finite mind, I can't really imagine that. What he's saying here is that it is a symbol of ownership. In, in, in the cattle industry, the people that own the cattle, they brand their cattle. They mark them. This is the kind of idea here, that God is going to brand us with his name. Because we are his, we belong to him. We are his intimate creation. We are those that he has loved from the beginning, and he will love for eternity. And we will be completely his. We don't have to wonder about his love. We don't have to wonder about direction for our lives. We don't have to worry about security or safety, because we will be his. We will have his name on our heads. And it says, Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light. 1 John 1, 5 says, Now this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. Some of us, when we think of this, we think of a blinding light. We think of a light that you wake up first thing in the morning, and you turn the light on, and it's shocking. Some of you got this morning, and that's the way it was. That's the way I was. But this light is not going to be something that is shocking. This light is going to be soothing. It is going to be brighter than the sun, but yet we won't be sunburned. It is going to be welcoming. It's going to be inviting. It is going to put light on everything. We won't need any lamps in our houses. God himself will be the light, it's a, it's a light that's welcoming. It will, he will shine on everything around us so that we can fully see the beauty of God. What a day that will be. Finally, we see, and they will reign forever and ever. We will have eternal purpose. Eternal purpose. Now, I picture this as when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them dominion over the garden to take care of what he had created. And I picture here that we see the same thing, that we will reign with him forever, that he is going to put us each in charge of part of his creation. Universes possibly, stars, galaxies, however it is, I don't understand it. But he will put us, those who have followed him and put our faith in him, been repented before him, he will put us and we will reign forever and ever, and ever. Has anybody ever wondered how you can serve and worship the Lord? Has anybody ever prayed, God, what do I do next? Any of you ever prayed, God, what am I here for? I mean, what's my purpose on this earth? Have you, have you ever prayed, God, I just need some direction on this? Well, we will know for eternity what God has made us to do and who he has made us to be. And I'll tell you, that will give us peace because more of our anxiety as Christians, more of our, our, our tension that we have is because oftentimes we don't know what to do next. You see, that will be gone. We won't have to pray for our lost family members. We won't have to pray for all this. We will have eternal purpose with Him. We think of heaven and I found a beautiful letter. There was a pastor, Charles Fuller. He had announced to the congregation in the small town that they was going to be preaching on heaven the next few Sundays. And so there was one older gentleman. He was up in his 90s. He wrote this letter to Pastor Fuller that week before he began to preach on heaven. And this is an excerpt from that letter. He says, Sir, next Sunday you're about to talk about heaven. I am interested in that land because I have held a clear title to a bit of that property there for over 55 years. He said, I did not buy it. It was given to me without money and without price, but the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous sacrifice. I am not holding it for speculation since the title is not transferable and it is not a vacant lot. For more than a half century, I've been sending materials out of this land for which the great builder of the universe has been building a home for me which will never need to be remodeled nor repaired because it will suit me perfectly, individually. 
and will never grow old. Termites can never undermine its foundation, for they rest on the rock of ages. Fire cannot destroy it. Floods cannot wash it away. No locks or bolts will ever be placed upon its doors. No vicious person can ever enter the land where my dwelling stands. Now almost completed and almost ready for me to enter in and abide in peace eternally without fear of being rejected. There is a valley of deep shadow between the place where I live in California and that to which I shall journey in a very short time. I cannot reach my home in the city of God without passing through this dark valley of shadows, but I am not afraid because the best friend I have ever known has gone with it, with me through the same valley long, long ago and drove away its gloom. He has stuck by me through thick and thin since we first became acquainted 55 years ago, and I hold his promise in printed form never to forsake me or to leave me alone. He will be with me as I walk through the valley of the shadows, and I shall not lose my way when he is with me. I hope to hear your sermon on heaven next Sunday from my home in Los Angeles, California, but I have no assurance that I shall be able to do so. My ticket to heaven has no date marked on the journey, no return coupon, and no permit for baggage. Yes, I am all ready to go, and I may not be here while you're talking next Sunday evening but I shall meet you there someday. Amen. Are you captivated by this world? Are you captivated by the things of this world? Are you laying up for yourself treasures in heaven where a thief can't steal and Moth can't eat and rust can't touch. Or are you living this life for all you can get? You're going to have stuff stored up that all of your family is going to fight over to divide in your absence from this world. You see, I'd rather send everything ahead than nobody's going to fight over. I'm not going to have to detail in my will all of the things that I want to go to people because at the end of my life, I want to have nothing left but what I gave him in service and in worship. Today, if you're not a Christian, if you've never put your faith in Christ, if you've never bowed your knee to Christ and asked for forgiveness and, and seen the provision that Christ provided at the cross removing the curse of sin, the availability of salvation for all of us, then you will never see what we have been describing. You'll be apart from God forever. You'll be found in a place called hell that is real. And you will never see anything good or beautiful again. You see, we have to have Christ. Christ. All that we have seen and described and all that he is laying up for us is not for everyone to enjoy. It is for those who put their faith in him. It is for those who have repented of our sin and said, God, I want to put you on the throne of my life and I don't want to control things myself. And we give him everything. And then we get that little plot that he is preparing for us in heaven. Today, if you don't know Christ, I invite you to put your faith in Him, to know Him, to know the intimacy that we can have here, but will be far greater when we see Him face to face. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who are already in the faith, that you've put your faith in Christ, you've been forgiven, you walk with the Lord. Did you think about heaven when you get up this morning? Do you think about heaven during the day at all? Because I think when we think of the beauty of God and what's going to be happening, I think it changes the way we live here. When we can see the beauty of that, we're not going to focus and get suckered in by the little things in life that prick us and nag us and beat us and strangle us. Those little things that when we look at it, even a week later, they didn't matter anything. 
A year later, we're going to have forgotten it. We get to heaven, it's never going to have been an issue. But let me tell you, when we love as Christ loved, when we give as Christ gives, when we take care of those around us, when we look for the good of others instead of ourselves, when we serve God at the price of our hobbies, when we seek God at the price of what we love to do, when we serve Him and worship Him with sacrifice, we are laying up treasures in heaven that hopefully will be just piled up. Today, brothers and sisters, don't leave today without asking about your own ideas of heaven. Are you laying up treasures in heaven or are you laying up treasures here? I'm going to pray for us. It's a question we all need to ask. It's a question we need to ask the Lord because when we have a heavenly mindset, it changes the way we live in the here and now. Let's pray together. Lord, you're awesome and you are wonderful and you are beautiful. And I thank you that you have taken care of this for us. You've provided the place for us to be with you forever. You have decorated it for us. You have provided every perfect provision. And I'm thankful that we get to see you face to face. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here, Lord, that doesn't know you, that today they will. They'll put their faith in you, Lord God. They'll know you and, and, and the blessing of knowing you. And Lord, I pray for all of us that have already put our faith in you, Lord, that you change us today. Lord, that you help us to see that oh, much of the stuff we focus on here means nothing. Help us to have a vision for eternity. We love you, Lord, and we give you this time of invitation. And we do so for your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.